ready? Okay. All right. Um, I hope you had a, a good quick lunch, and um, uh, I would like us to start uh, the, our next uh, session, uh, where I'm privileged and honored to have with us from U.S. Uh, Professor John Papapolimeru. Um, uh, Professor Sir John Papolimeru, you can see him on the screen. Mm -hmm. Hello there. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Just a couple of uh, words uh, about um, uh, Professor Papolimeru. He's at uh, MS an MSU Foundation Processor and Chair of the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department of the Michigan State University. Uh, he has uh, been, uh, uh, um, and, and, and he has his first degree from the National Technical University of Athens, and of course he's been uh, uh, through the years uh, um, having his uh, MSc and PhD in the University of Michigan, and then he served as professor at uh, a number of universities at uh, Arizona Tucson, at uh, Limon in France, uh, in Georgia Institute of Technology and Georgia Tech, uh, before uh, his uh, current uh, tenure. Um, he's uh, an expert in a very nice, uh, I would say, area of more than more technologies that we uh, talked about in the morning today and uh, also comes from an area of Midwest uh, where essentially a semiconductor given the chips act in the US is uh, getting focus. So I think his perspective is gonna be very, very interesting for us uh, today. So that being said, uh, the chair is yours, Professor. All right, thank you very much, uh, John. Ευχαριστώ πολύ and καλησπέρα to everybody. So I hope you can see my screen. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right. So what I would like to do uh, in this presentation is to present to you uh, a little bit my perspective on what's going on uh, in terms of, of course, the semiconductor um, uh, future and technology, um, a little bit not only from the U.S. perspective, but also from the perspective of the Midwest part of the United States where I'm located. And also, uh, I have a few slides at the end to uh, let your um, uh, attendees, uh, uh, provide to your attendees a better understanding of Michigan State University, uh, what we do, uh, where we are. And uh, hopefully with that, steer some discussion about uh, the future and how um, US universities, and I would say also, of course, um, uh, the US semiconductor ecosystem may be able to, col to collaborate with, um, with Europe and uh, more specifically uh, with Greece. All right, so um, we know that microelectronics come in many different flavors, all right? So uh, they're today in every aspect of our life, from smartphones to uh, iPads, to sensing systems, to medical devices, biomedical devices. But as we know very well, um, they consist of a lot of different circuits. So they can be silicon CMOS logic, silicon memory, uh, power electronics, MEMS, silicon photonics, and of course, uh, RF electronics, mixed signal electronics, which as we know, become more and more important with uh, 5G systems and future 6G uh, plus systems. And we will uh, come back to that. Um, just to make uh, to mention here that it's not just the ICs themselves, but as we know, when we talk about products, um, we have an integration component to do. And um, you know, heterogeneous integration is a is a big part. I believe you have a session, uh, or you had one in the morning, or you have one in the afternoon. Uh, that uh, is a big player and will be an even big player as we approach the limit of Moore's law. As we know, we're down to a nanometer or, or um, um, less, and uh, that. Uh, will be more and more important. Okay, so uh, from the US perspective, I'll, to give a little bit of background, so the United States has been a leader in microelectronic design. However, we have not been a leader in microelectronic, pro in electronics and microelectronics production. So um, where things stand right now, only 12% of the global manufacturing capability uh, is in the United States. This uh, basically declined from about 37% in 1990 to 12%, and 75%, as we know very well of that, is concentrated in East Asia due to large government uh, subsidies. 
Now, um, there's a projected huge increase of, um, for the semiconductor manufacturing and need over the next 10 years. Right now, uh, globally, um, uh, semiconductors are about a half a billion uh, dollar market. A lot of studies projected to be uh, closer to a trillion uh, as, of course, uh, the demand increases. And another point to remember is that a new fab in the U.S. costs 30% more, of course, to build than um, other countries such as Taiwan and South Korea, and uh, even more as compared to uh, China. Now, um, you know, what we've noticed the last few years, and uh, that's what have precipitated, I think, some of the things that have happened, is um, the effect of the pandemic. Um, as it relates to the United States, directly the semiconductor industry employs about 250,000 people and uh, supports uh, close to 1.8, 1.9 million uh, jobs. Uh, of course, COVID, as you can see here, threw a wrench, as we say here, so it, it disrupted uh, a lot of things. And uh, what people uh, saw is that, um, you know, those things that most of the people do not understand, the, the small circuits that uh, are in every car, uh, in all of our appliances, can really, really uh, cause a lot of trouble, right? So, uh, for example, the auto industry, where, um, you know, uh, typically a car has now, you know, thousands of electronic circuits, uh, the production can come to a halt because of the lack uh, of chips. So uh, just to give you an idea where I live, I'm very close to some of the General Motors factories and those plants were shut down for uh, at least three, four weeks uh, to some of them a couple of months because of the lack of boards uh, that had the chips that were needed to provide uh, a given functionality uh, for the car. Uh, similar with consumer electronics, but uh, you know, with cars and uh, Michigan, of course, is the auto capital. Detroit is the auto capital of the United States. Uh, that had a huge uh, impact. So uh, this is what, of course, uh, was going on. And, um, you know, um, diversifying, I would say, geographically, the production of semiconductors, this is something that, you know, people and companies were considering even before the pandemic. But I think the pandemic uh, throwing a wrench uh, made that uh, need much more emphatic. And, uh, you know, right, right before, uh, I would say, some of the uh, recent developments we've had, there was a lot of uh, uh, consideration from several companies to uh, provide, of course, um, expanded capability for uh, fabrication of electronics. And, of course, that was done uh, to some extent uh, in collaboration with uh, the various governments. So we've seen this from uh, European Union. Of course, there was the discussion with uh, the United States government. Uh, and uh, again, uh, as I said before, um, you know, there's a, the expectation is that this industry is going to grow even more uh, to a trillion. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, new areas that will need uh, semiconductor chips. We mentioned a bit 6G. Of course, our artificial intelligence, you know, based uh, circuits and applications will also, uh, you know, take advantage of that. Um, you know, quantum computing, uh, and of course, uh, many, many more. So um, all of that, uh, basically, from the United States perspective, led to the U.S. Chips Act, the creating helpful incentives to produce semiconductor. Um, uh, here you see uh, President Biden holding a silicon wafer. Uh, this came into law, was signed into law on August 9th, uh, 2022, so we're talking only a few months ago. And um, basically, it's, it's a plan for over the next 10 years to provide approximately $280 billion in spending to uh, bolster the semiconductor capacity in the United States, so basically onshoring uh, a lot of the fabrication, catalyze uh, research and development, uh, create the regional high-tech hubs where scientists from universities, companies, federal labs can work together and provide uh, new technologies that could then be uh, fabricated uh, for most of the part in the United States. So one of the biggest roadblocks that we had so far is that, uh, as I said in the beginning, the U.S. is a leader in the design but uh, a big roadblock is that a lot of these uh, designs, if most of them, I would say, they have to be fabricated elsewhere, and uh, including 
for a lot of us in the universities, we see that where a given foundry, uh, you know, you have to use TSMC in Taiwan or maybe uh, another foundry in another country. So that has uh, put a little bit of the brakes. So the idea with this new law is to for this to basically not be an issue uh, anymore. Uh, and all of the innovation basically that will uh, be produced by um, the various researchers can also be translated into circuits that can be fabricated in the United States. A uh, big component also of this effort is to create a very inclusive STEM force. So um, microelectronics uh, is an area where you know, we don't see a lot of diversity and um, this act basically provides the necessary tools uh, via the appropriate funding so we can further diversify, basically capture a much larger uh, portion of the uh, US population that is gonna be interested uh, in this industry. Um, as you also see here, this is the breakdown. Uh, a lot of it goes to STEM that will be handled by the NSF. Uh, there's also other areas. Uh, just to mention, uh, uh, one of them is the, the Chips for America Defense Fund, two billion. So already the Department of Defense um, is, uh, has underway the, what they call the Commons, uh, Microelectronics for Commons program. Again, to uh, create these high-tech hubs that will provide the uh, new technology, if you wish, for kind of the needs for the Department of Defense. Uh, the uh, soaring of the semiconductors will be, will be handled by the, by the United, States, United States Department of Commerce. Uh, we'll oversee about 50 billion in investments to expand the domestic manufacturing of mature and advanced semiconductors. Okay, that includes 11 billion for advanced, again, R&D. And of course, uh, the rest will be to accelerate and drive the domestic uh, chip production. So one important note uh, for the CHIPS Act is that it, 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 its foundation, if you wish, is through public and private partnerships, okay? Part of it also provides uh, the 24 billion in tax incentives. So basically, uh, the government will, will provide a 25% uh, investment tax credit uh, for uh, companies that would like to uh, invest in fabrication capability in the United States. Uh, a big part of that uh, will be handled by NSF, as you can see, STEM, the Moon and Mars. So uh, most of it from the National Science Foundation, also, of course, from the Department of Energy. NASA also has uh, a role in this. Uh, as um, you know, we talk about the Moon and Mars, there's a need for rad hard electronics. Uh, and at the end, I will mention where Michigan State University, we are playing a role in this as those are electronics that need to, of course, uh, undergo through special design uh, and or packaging to protect them from harmful an ion, uh, ionizing radiation beyond the LEO uh, kind of level. Um, okay. So um, we have this CHIPS Act that now has been signed uh, over a few months. And how, wh what did that cause? And as I say here, things started happening, right? So we can see in the Midwest area, Intel uh, made the decision to build two foundries uh, worth of about $20 billion. This is in the Columbus area which is the capital of Ohio. Uh, and of course, in Columbus, uh, we have Ohio State uh, University. Um, uh, already, they are looking for about 3,000 engineers that uh, they need uh, about two years to train them so then they can uh, be employed in, in the foundry. And of course, um, you know, around this investment in this area, Ohio is just south of Michigan. There's other also companies that uh, are um, you know, interested to, to join the area uh, that will be part of this supply chain. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, you have the chips, but also we have kind of the board level package chips that go into products. So uh, that is uh, an area I think that the Chips Act is targeting a lot. So how do we basically make sure we develop the talent, but also the supply chain to sort of go from lab to fab, all right? So this is a common theme that maybe some of you will hear uh, under the Chips Act. So we wanna be able to go from you know, the lab to the final fabricated component. And that of course, may, you know, is not gonna be just a, an IC by itself, uh, but, but a, a module. Uh, we also had in Indiana, again, in the Midwest, another investment from Skywater. Skywater um, is known to do 90 nanometer uh, kind of based silicon processing. They're based in Minnesota, which is considered upper Midwest. 
They've made an investment in Indiana to work close with Purdue University. Uh, they are also into 3.5 semiconductors. So again, um, you know, through this CHIPS Act, we can see how this has started to catalyze uh, the semiconductor uh, ecosystem in the United States. Now, in Michigan, we've had so far two uh, new uh, investments expansion. So one is Hemlock Semiconductors that are already uh, in the area. They uh, announced a $375 million expansion. And then SK Salton, which already was here, uh, in, they're increasing, they're expanding their facilities, about 300 uh, million investment that you can see the photo here with our governor, Gretchen Whitmer. Uh, that has been announced actually um, a few weeks ago. Micron announced a $100 billion investment uh, to build a mega farm in uh, basically central New York, close to the Syracuse area. Uh, and uh, what I also wanted to you know, emphasize here is not just the direct ICs, but also in this uh, area of applications, right? We talked about uh, 5G, 6G, uh, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, semi-autonomous vehicles. So um, a lot of electronics will be needed to also support those systems, right? So um, our next energy, which basically is a battery manufacturing campus, they announced $1.6 million investment uh, in Michigan to provide the batteries and um, you know, systems needed to support electric vehicles. And this just in, as I was preparing for this presentation, uh, this is just as of yesterday, basically. Uh, TSMC had originally announced a four nanometer fab in Arizona, and now they added a three nanometer fab. And Tim Cook, uh, the uh, Apple CEO, uh, made the announcement that basically, for the most part of it, Apple will purchase uh, chips that are built uh, in the United States in that Arizona fabrication. So uh, what this, th the story that this tells us is that basically with the right uh, public-private partnerships, things can happen. Uh, of course, this is only the beginning, so a lot of things you know, still need to happen. Uh, a key thing for this to be successful is the workforce development. Uh, a lot of electronics engineers and, and other areas, right? Of course, because you have materials also, packaging, um, heterogeneous integration is going to be front and center. So a lot of other things are needed, but um, I think this is a very, very good beginning, very good start to, um, you know, start bringing the um, fabrication uh, along with the innovation in the design, all right, back to uh, the United States. So why the Midwest, right? So I said coming back to the Midwest, so from the Silicon Valley to the Silicon Heartland, uh, as you probably know, the Midwest tradition has been the Rust Belt. Uh, a lot of the steel mills the factories are in the uh, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio area, as well as other states uh, of, of the Midwest. Michigan and Detroit is the uh, automotive capital of the United States. So there's a long history and tradition into manufacturing, which means people and facilities. So the right infrastructure already exists. But um, Again, um, you know, looking into and, and, and having the discussions with, with our colleagues here in the United States, talking about tens of thousands of people that will need to be employed uh, by these factories uh, and, and related applications, where do you find basically um, that capacity? So you need to be in an area that is, I think, rich in tradition, uh, as well as also rich in universities, and the Midwest uh, provides that, uh, access to top talent and university R&D. Uh, a lot of the Big Ten uh, universities are located in the Midwest with very large and strong uh, engineering uh, schools. Also, the expertise in system assembly. So I, I kind of want to go beyond the chips to the chips plus, right? So as we said, we fabricate the ICs, but, you know, integrating them and making them into a modular product, that's extremely important. And uh, part of the discussion we have here in the United States is that well, not only do we need to produce the, the chip itself, but then if, again, I have to offshore, you know, the packaging and the assembly, that can also in the future create uh, uh, bottlenecks. Uh, a few also other items is access to the largest freshwater supply. So the Great Lakes um, have huge supply of fresh water, which is needed to run, of course, microfabrication uh, plants relatively low cost of living and very strong K-12 public education system. So that's, again, to attract uh, the people. So what has been happening, uh, probably most of you uh, do not know, is that the universities in the area, once Intel made the announcement, uh, we have created the Midwest Regional Network. So this is a dozen uh, universities 
Michigan State is part of that, as well as the University of Michigan uh, in Ann Arbor. And basically, uh, this helps us coordinate, coordinate better and plan uh, for initiatives in the semiconductor microelectronics area. Part of that includes to basically have a better understanding of the facilities that each one of us has, so that, because we want to create this research corridor among all of these universities uh, that so we can share use facilities. So there's no need to duplicate facilities, of course. So we want we want to be able to do that. And then, of course, is to start creating these hubs, okay, uh, that will uh, catalyze uh, the innovation, the new ideas. So we already had a meeting uh, back in April to uh, discuss um, all of these activities. I was part of this um, delegation representing MSU, and we already have uh, mapped out several areas within the microelectronics where uh, we can start uh, collaborating so that we can uh, basically uh, start developing the technology. And most importantly, as you can see, given the number of the universities, start creating the workforce, all right? So that's, that's gonna be extremely important if this is gonna be uh, successful. So how can we work together, right? So basically what we do in the US versus the EU, of course, there is the EU CHIPS Act. Uh, I think uh, three main uh, uh, points, not the only ones, but uh, through university partnerships, all right, for workforce development, as well as, of course, technology development, um, undergraduate, graduate dual degree programs, faculty research exchanges, joint research project hubs. I could see, for example, Greek, universities uh, and also companies being part of these hubs and collaborating with us. Uh, same for industry partnerships and of course, uh, efforts in, in entrepreneurship. Um, you know, probably uh, having, uh, and again, I, I don't know everything about the EU, EU CHIPS Act, but manufacturing in Greece is, is probably gonna be uh, limited, but uh, design and, and basically IP development as part of joint research projects, uh, within hubs, and again, hubs consist both of universities and companies. I think that's very, very uh, feasible. So a little bit, and, and these are, I will end my presentation, a little bit of info on Michigan State University. So we are, this is the state of Michigan, consisting of the Lower Peninsula and the Upper Peninsula. You can see the Great Lakes. The capital of Michigan is Lansing. We're in East Lansing, which is right next to it. Uh, Detroit is about 80 miles, so it's about an hour and 20 minute drive. Uh, we have 50,000 students, more than 1,400 faculty. Uh, you see hundreds of academic programs. Uh, research expenditures are about the last, the most recent data, $750 million, um, more than 100 institutes and centers. Within the College of Engineering, we have eight academic departments, uh, about 243 tenure system faculty. Uh, we cover uh, various research priorities. Uh, electronics, of course, is one of them, and more specifically, space electronics. And uh, we do have a dual PhD degree program already with the National Technical University of Athens, uh, which has already also produced one graduate, and we're looking to grow that. Uh, we were also part of the, the FARO Summit, uh, which occurred last month, and we had the opportunity to talk to other universities and we're also looking to expand our collaboration, both in terms of graduate programs as well as undergraduate uh, programs. So um, recently we launched the MSU Center for Space Electronics. As I said in the beginning, uh, there is uh, increased need, uh, not just for scientific missions, but also for commercial systems uh, that are out in space. So there's an incre increased need for uh, electronics. And uh, of course, the question is how do, first of all, you test these electronics um, in the lab, all right, but emulating the space environment? And then how do you uh, improve that technology, right? So uh, depending again on the specifics of the space mission. So uh, in collaboration with Texas Instruments, uh, we've started this Space Electronics Center. Uh, the unique capability we have aside from the talent in the College of Engineering and of course the faculty is the facility for rare isotope beams. This is a facility, a $1 billion facility that was just inaugurated by the Department of Defense. And it's the strongest accelerator in the world. Uh, basically, um, yeah, this is for uh, nuclear physics experiments uh, that can reach up to about one giga uh, EV per nucleon uh, values. But of course we can use uh, the accelerator as well as the know-how that the uh, AFRIP has 
to perform um, testing, for example, single event testing and other testing to emulate the space environment. So we have already started doing this. And uh, the idea is test, of course, design, develop IP, and of course, involve students and researchers, all right? So uh, again, uh, we are here uh, as a university to develop the workforce. And I think doing that with industry uh, is, is extremely important. Uh, and this uh, makes sense for us. Um, part, of, a part of our center also is the MSU Fraunhofer Diamond Center, which is located in the area of East Lansing within our campus. So Diamond Electronics, of course, is another area of electronics uh, that uh, a lot of things are expected to happen. And I think uh, that coexistence is is a, is an excellent example of uh, you know what one can do uh, to um, you know expand the ecosystem and I think take advantage of all of the uh, participants. So I will stop here. I would like to thank you for your attention and I don't know if we have time for any questions. I'll be more than happy to uh, answer any questions. Um, I want to thank you for uh, your keynote, uh, uh, John, and um, given the. The time we probably will uh, pick up the questions and uh, uh, send them over. Uh, I would say okay. let's keep in touch and see how we can uh, get the collaboration going as we uh, think there are many commons that uh, we are actually trying to do uh, at our side here. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.